While Sparta is gaining control of the Peloponnesus, Athens is largely growing to be the dominant force in the Attic Peninsula. Um, it had actually been 12 different Poleus that realized that if they got together, their forces united would make them particularly strong. Um, and Athens was quite similar to most other city-states, most other Poleus, with really just two different exceptions. One, it had a way larger geographic scope and population. Um, remember, upwards of a quarter million. Um, and secondly, the people that they conquered were actually integrated over generations into Athenian society instead of becoming slaves like had been the case in Sparta. And if you think about it, one of the things we didn't really cover on the last slide is if you've got a huge slave population that is forced to do tons of agricultural labor, you also need a huge military force to prevent those slaves from rebelling. And because Athens doesn't have that slave population, they don't have the necessity of a huge military or police force either. By the middle of 500s BC, um, it is probably the place that is the most commercial, most trade-driven, um, highest standard of living than anywhere else in ancient Greece. And by 500 BC, a new political organization is instituted whereby citizens take a pretty direct role in governing the city-state itself. And this new system is known as democratia, rule by the entire body of citizens. Now again, keep in mind, citizens are only men from the right family um, at this point who own a certain amount of property, and that's about it. So not foreigners, certainly not slaves, not peasants that don't own land, not people who hadn't been Athenians for long enough, and definitely not women. So it, it's not a true democracy, <clears throat> but it does allow for the participation in government of everybody who is one of those citizens. One of the developments that comes out of this is, uh, and you know this from the textbook, a council of 500, which really planned the business for the city. People were elected to serve here. Um, all citizens over 30 could serve a term of one year. Nobody could do it more than twice, which meant that everybody had a huge opportunity to participate in politics, and it was expected of them. They got familiar with it. Um, within those, there were people who were uh, elevated to a more governing position. Um, probably the best known of those are a couple of folks that we'll cover. One is Cleisthenes. Um, I won't spell his name out because you can look it up in the textbook real quick. Um, he was very important in developing both that Council of 500, but also in dividing Athenian citizens up into different districts. He called them ten tribes, um, and having a balance in the council from them. Um, we also recognize that because of this, there's a huge rapid turnover in what Athenians participate in politics. And that means that a large percentage of them have experience there. And the membership of that assembly that governed and made decisions for Athens was pretty sophisticated. Um, the second person that we want to bring up in relation to Athens is a guy who comes to power um, around 460 BC named Pericles. Uh, and he used power of the law courts and, and the assembly to break up the Council of 500 and in many ways kind of create a dictatorship in a period of crisis. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, so we'll revisit him when we come to the Peloponnesian Wars in just a little bit. 